Teresa Phillips, Dr. William Pickens, and Julia Beatty. Welcome. Welcome everyone. Um, we want to thank y'all so much for joining us today. I'm Julia Beatty with the Carolina Family Engagement Center and in just a moment we are going to have each of the presenters introduce themselves and let you know where they do the amazing work they do. Um, but before we get started, we just wanted to let you know that you are welcome and encouraged to submit any questions you have as we go through the chat box. We will reserve those for the end of our session where we'll have about 10 minutes to answer any of those questions you've already submitted, as well as any that you have live. Um, but please do remember as a courtesy to meet your microphone unless you're sharing during that Q&A time or you are one of the presenters. Um, if, you're, if you're able, we would love to invite you to have a device handy that has a QR scanner because we will have a few things available for you to access and participate um, today. If you've got one of those handy, just have it um, with you for an optimal experience. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lorelai Swanson to kick off our introductions. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Lorelai Swanson. I'm the Upstate Regional Family Engagement Liaison. And I am Julia Beatty. I am also a regional family engagement liaison partnered with Upper Central South Carolina with the Carolina Family Engagement Center. Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Phillips. I am with Anderson School District 2, and I work with mental health services and with Project AWARE. Good morning, everybody. First of all, glad to be in this space. Uh, Will Pickens, the Chief Administrative Services Officer. And that long title essentially is Student Services and Community and Business Partnerships, as well as the Ombudsman. So I am the Chief Administrative Officer of uh, Chester County School, School District, which is about 45 miles south of uh, Charlotte. And unlike Charlotte, we are a rural district that includes Great Falls, uh, Richburg, and Chester. And we have roughly 15 schools that include our adult education, uh, alternative program, and our career center. Glad to be here. Before we dive into today, today's presentation, we would like to invite you to take a moment to pause. So sit up tall, feel your sit bones connected to your chair, ground your feet into the floor beneath you, Broaden your chest, soften your belly, lower your eyelids, and begin to notice your breath. You may become aware of air flowing in and out of your nostrils. You may notice your chest expanding, or you may notice your belly rising and falling. Now take a moment to think about a time that you your school or district did something that really connected with a family or a group of families to support student social and emotional development. What is it about this practice or strategy that really resonated with families and helped you to connect with them in meaningful ways to nurture student social and emotional growth? Now slowly bring your awareness back to your body. Feel your feet on the floor. Return your awareness to the surroundings in the room and bring your attention back to the presentation slide. So if you were in the session earlier, um, we had many opportunities to share and we wanna provide you with an opportunity to, sh to share as well. So whether it's on your computer or on your mobile device, we wanna invite you to join a live poll um, where we'd love to hear from you what the strategies were that came to mind or maybe one in particular that you are maybe currently using, you've used in the past that was very successful in partnering with families related to SEL. So you can either scan this QR code or if you need to type in, it's slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. And the code to join if you're typing that in is 468257. Um, and as 
those responses are submitted, we will start to see them coming in. So feel free to join in um, and participate. Okay, so academic celebrations, fantastic. And celebrating is a huge way of supporting family engagement. Our teachers love it, our students love it, our families love it. Absolutely, listening and reflecting their concerns. That goes a long way to building those bridges and relationships. All right, just another moment or two. Incentives, uh-huh, great. Well, thank y'all. These are some great ideas um, to kick us off. Character trait initiatives, fantastic. That is great. And that, that, these are character traits that we wanna foster in our students and in our adults. So when we can do this in conjunction with families, it's a win-win situation, fantastic, okay. Well, thank you for sharing those. If you're still typing it in, feel free. It'll still continue to capture. But I want to start off our time today by giving you a little bit of an overview about the Carolina Family Engagement Center. So we are a federally funded center. We're one of 12 across the U.S. We were awarded a five-year grant beginning in 2018. And um, our lead partner for this grant that's funded by the U.S. Department of Education is actually the South Carolina Department of Education. We work closely with them and we are thrilled to be able to be part of their summit today. Um, but we also work closely uh, in partnership with 10 community partner organizations that are located across South Carolina. And all of these organizations really share our commitment to supporting all children and all families in South Carolina. So um, we work in close partnership with eight district partners. Um, these are four-year partnerships, which we began back in fall of 2019. And within those district partnerships, we have over 24 school partnerships that are currently in place. And we are very excited to have two of our district level social and emotional learning champions here with us today. You'll get to hear from them later about some of the amazing work that they have been doing. Um, but we also wanna let you know that their work was recently featured in an article in the Learning Professional um, just last month in August of 2021. And if you'd like to read that article, you're welcome to scan that QR code um, and it'll take you there. You can read examples of the work that they did, some of which they'll probably share today, but obviously for the interest of time, we won't be able to read or hear about all of it, but you're welcome to read it. Um, and that is Dr. Will Pickens and Ms. Teresa Phillips. Um, also with the Carolina Family Engagement Center, I would be remiss if I didn't explain that we do our work regionally. You may have heard Lorelai and I already mention that we both cover the upstate and the upper central regions, but we also work with another liaison, Ms. Lorraine Galito Battelle, who covers the Midlands, Ms. Renina Outing, who covers the PD region, and Ms. Clarissa Thompson, who is part of the Low Country and Midlands regions. Um, and we are just partnered closely with our districts, with our schools, and glad to be a resource. If we can ever help you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, our, um, our next uh, piece of our work that we want to cover is how, how do we achieve our goals um, as CFEC? There's lots of different ways that this can be done, but our main way is by capacity building. So our each of our regional liaisons provides training as well as technical assistance to those partner schools as well as districts and families that are present in those schools and districts. We also work closely with our school improvement councils, which are local stakeholder teams to help foster those school family community collaborations, um, having conversations that, you know, with everyone sitting around the table or the virtual table as we're doing recently, um, really diving into that collaborative and partnership dialogue. We also provide support to 40 teachers um, at a classroom level, and we are helping them evaluate and kind of plan and implement their own family engagement efforts. And then finally, 
um, we are kicking off our second uh, cohort of our parent leadership program where we provide advocacy and leadership trainings to families throughout South Carolina through the parent leadership program. And the reason that we do all of this work, the reason that we have regionally based work, the reason that we partner with our districts, with our schools, with our teachers, is we want to see equity, opportunity, and excellence for all families in all parts of South Carolina, rural, urban, suburban. And we wanna see this for our families of focus, specifically our Latino and Latinx families, our English language learning families, migrant families, also our families of racial and ethnic minorities, our families who have children living with disabilities or special medical needs, our families who might be experiencing homelessness or families where a grandparent is raising um, the child as a primary caregiver. We also wanna make sure that our families who might be caring for a child involved in the foster care system or families who are living with low incomes, we want them all to have equitable opportunities and excellence in education. Um, and we know that we, as, long, as well as our partners and our districts are working towards seeing that for all of our students together. And I'm gonna hand it over to Lorelai to talk a little about SEL. So now that we've learned a little bit about CFEC, we'll turn our presentation over to focusing on the critical role that family school partnerships play in nurturing students, social and emotional growth and development for all students. We believe that nurturing student SEL is important now more than ever. Considering the unexpected school closings in the spring of 2020 leading to social isolation, loss of instructional time, decreased student engagement, economic hardship, and increased disparities in health and education for our families of focus. These school closings were followed by unprecedented school reopening plans, including distance and hybrid models, and strict social distancing requirements for in-person learning during the 2021 school year. And just as we were hopeful for a fresh start in the fall of 2021, we're faced with an unexpected um, increase in the number of COVID-19 cases and student and teacher quarantine, as well as political division about mask and vaccine requirements in our school communities. All of this is leading to increased uncertainty and exasperated anxiety for students, educators, and families. Here are a few of the research findings on the impact of the pandemic on student mental health. This is from a report published by the Office of Civil Rights in July of 2021. So nearly three in 10 parents surveyed in a Gallup poll said their child was experiencing harm to their emotional or mental health with 45% citing the separation from teachers and classmates as the major challenge. Suicidal ideation is on the rise among children and young adults as shutdowns and social isolation undermine many students' mental and emotional well being. Even those with less severe responses overwhelmingly reported negative feelings during the pandemic. Educators, parents, and school leaders across the country cited social and emotional well being as the major challenge facing students, especially for those students learning from home. And many school districts experience staff shortages and making it very difficult to support students who are struggling. And finally, according to the National Association of Elementary School Principals, nearly 70% of school principals said they could not meet their students' mental health needs with the staff that they had. These findings make it clear that SEL and student mental health are a top priority in education for the new school year. While we've learned to give teachers the tools and resources they need to support student SEL at school, we too often neglect to give families the tools and resources they need to support student SEL at home. In the article that we published in Learning Professional, we make the case that educators must partner with families to sufficiently nurture student SEL. And this makes sense considering parents are the experts on their children's unique social, emotional, and behavioral development, and they've been influencing their child's SEL since birth. 
During the pandemic, we asked parents to share responsibility for student learning and they stepped up for this challenge. We argue that families are equally care capable of sharing responsibility and decision making when it comes to supporting student SEL. Given the influence of both parents and educators on student SEL, a plan that focuses on one without the other is likely to fall short. And our final underlying assumption for our SEL family school partnership framework is equity. Collective challenges we've faced as a result of the pandemic, including increased health, economic, and education disparities for families who have been historically marginalized, and our recent heightened awareness of systemic racism underscore the importance of equity and the strides we need to make. This requires a fundamental shift in how we look at supporting student SEL and mental health. It requires us to move beyond telling students how, how to behave and move toward giving students the space they need to reflect on their behavior in a supportive environment. It requires moving beyond simply providing mental health services and supports and moving toward creating learning spaces where students feel emotionally and physically safe. It requires us to move beyond teaching students how to empathize and reflect, reflect, respect diverse cultures and moving toward building empathy and cultural competence in the adults who care for them. And finally, it requires us to move beyond telling parents how student SEL is supported at school and moving toward inviting all parents to have a seat at the table when we're deciding how to form these family school partnerships that, su that support student SEL. With all that Lorelai just described um, in mind, we have been thinking about this since really the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, and we've continued to have conversations with our schools, with our districts. Um, we've been examining a lot of different ideas and ways of supporting them, and one of the frameworks that we found that we think is foundational to any type of partnership, including SEL partnership, between families and schools is the CASEL strategies that are recommended here in green. Those, um, those six different strategies that they recommend are using two-way communication with families, engaging families, increasing family involvement in academics as well as in social and emotional learning, also involving families in decision-making, helping bridge constraints, and increasing capacity of school staff to partner with families. Now, as we looked at these different strategies, um, Lorelai and I sat down and spent some time developing some questions to help schools and district leaders assess how, how are things going right now um, and how might they you know, develop additional plans for the future in alignment with these strategies. So the guiding questions that we developed and used in partnership with um, Dr. Will Pickens and Ms. Teresa Phillips to help discuss what was going on in their districts are also listed here. And we would encourage you to consider these in your context as well. So what are the two-way communication vehicles your school or your district currently has in place to maximize teamwork and minimize misunderstanding as to what SEL is, as well as why it's important to high quality education? Secondly, what opportunities are there to invite families to share their expertise about their children? Um, as far as engaging families, what events and activities are planned that give families opportunities to learn more about SEL as well as to engage in it with their children? What initiatives do you have in place that might give an open door and a welcoming invitation for all families to be involved in SEL? As a means of assessing increased involvement in academics as well as SEL, what initiatives or strategies does your school or your district use to help your families become more involved in SEL at home? And that will help support the SEL you're doing at school. What are the opportunities that your school or district has in place to give all families an opportunity to have a seat at the table when it comes to decision-making time about SEL? 
And then do your families participate on your SEL teams? It's very likely that there are educators and other staff, perhaps district personnel, but where are your families on your teams that are devoted to continued work on SEL? As far as bridging constraints go, what are the unique measures your school or your district has in place to help bridge barriers for families? These barriers might include language, perhaps work schedules, limited access to technology and the internet, transportation, childcare, lack of knowledge about these opportunities you have, perhaps their own previous negative school experiences or their perceptions about availability of school staff. And then finally, what are the professional learning opportunities you've provided school staff to help them gain skills in those meaningful, culturally responsive family school partnership skills that really help support student learning and development? So we um, sat down with um, Dr. Pickens and with Ms. Teresa Phillips, and we talked about um, you know, just using these questions to discuss what um, they were doing in their districts and Lorelai and I developed a series of strategies that we um, recommend that um, in light of the pandemic that schools use to help respond to their family school partnership needs. Um, we've got both the framework here as well as guiding questions. So the first is responding to COVID-19. How are we allocating resources to do that um, effectively? Then developing systemic approaches. We know that it takes system-wide response to address system-wide issues and challenges. Thirdly, expanding mental health services. Fourth, form community partnerships with community members. Next, finding the right program champion. And finally, and this has already been mentioned by one of y'all, celebrating and recognizing success. So we took these um, strategies and really develop these out of that partnership and that conversation that we'd already had. And the, the guiding questions we developed to go along with this are also listed here on the screen. So how does your district or your school plan to use state and federal funds to support SEL as well as family engagement in response to the impact of COVID-19 on student mental health and well-being? How does your district or school provide opportunities to students and families to help them recover from losses in both academics and social and emotional well being. What are the systemic strategies that your school and district are using to ensure that SEL is embedded throughout the school community? What are strategies and practices in place that help that meet, meet the needs of students who do require the highest levels of mental health interventions and supports? With your community partnerships, what local community resources could you use to strengthen SEL and build connections with all families? You might have partnerships with nonprofits, businesses, faith-based institutions, et cetera. Finally, a program champion is someone who has that considerable influence within your school community and capacity to influence staff and schools to support the SEL initiative. So who is that person that is key to this effort? And finally, what practices are you using to recognize and celebrate those achievements that you make, both little and, and big, in SEL as well as in school family partnership? And I'm going to turn this next part over to Lorelai to give you an amazing current example from this. Uh... Yeah, one final thing that we did want to point out before we turn the presentation over to Ms. Phillips and Dr. Pickens is the potential of elementary and secondary school emergency relief or ESSER funds and supporting your work in nurturing family school partnerships and student SEL, especially in terms of our first post-pandemic strategy of resource allocation. Student SEL and mental health was a major focus for using ESSER funds and developing ESSER spending plans in our schools and districts. ESSER spending plans are required to be equity focused and developing um, and reduce, designed to reduce the disparity, disparities in education amplified by the pandemic. There is flexibility in ESSER spending plans, so we can, we can have some flexibility as we meet new challenges in our schools and districts. Meaningful stakeholder feedback from a diverse and representative school group, including parents, educators, community leaders, and high school students, was required in the development of ESSER spending plans 
And it is also required in providing ongoing monitoring and uh, evaluation of how schools and districts are actually implementing their ESSER spending plans. So we've developed a variety of resources at CFAC to help community stakeholders understand what ESSER funds are and also how to share their voice with student, with school and district leaders regarding the development and implementation of ESSER spending plans. So if you um, go to this link on our PowerPoint, you'll see all our, you'll find all our ESSER resources there. And now that we've kind of laid out the basic tenets of our um, school family partnership framework in SEL. I'm going to turn to turn it over to um, Ms. Phillips and Dr. Pickens for the heart of our presentation as they share their district experiences with us. So I'll I'll go first and I want to before I begin, I do want to highlight what Julia and Laura Lai were saying about uh, parental and, and community engagement. Whenever I get an opportunity to talk to a beautiful minds, I try to share statistics. So from birth to age 18, including summertime, sleep time, vacation, holidays, students only actually spend about 15 to 18% of their time in school. A lot of time you hear people say, well, they spend the bulk of their time at the school and it's not the case. They spend a the bulk of their time in the community at, and, and at home. So it speaks to uh, the importance of engaging and involving parents because students spend the overwhelming majority of their time in, um, in the community and at home. So uh, I certainly want to double click on that. Um, in Chester County School District, uh, one of our initiatives is uh, we are becoming a trauma-informed district, meaning that um, we want our teachers, uh, school counselors, everyone across our district to understand what trauma looks like, sounds like, feels like for our students. We know that prior to COVID, um, our students were experiencing trauma and COVID has done nothing but compound the stress that our students are seeing. And so we want all of our students, all of our faculty and staff, and folks across the district to understand what trauma is and what we can do about it. And so right now we're, we're on the implementation phase. We partner with Spartanburg Academic Movement, specifically Dr. Parker, and she's helping us to carry this work with trauma-informed. And so uh, currently, our district staff, including our superintendent, Dr. Anton Sutton, all of our chief officers, our executive directors have received level one training. Our principals and our assistant principals have received level one training. And most recently, our school counselors have received uh, level one training. And we're going to go a little bit deeper with our school counselors. They're going to be the ones who are charged with providing professional development to our teachers in their respective schools. And so they'll be getting level two and level three, and then we can get that uh, throughout the district. So we haven't arrived. We're still uh, implementing and, and pushing it forward. But we do know that our, um, our, our students need it as well as our teachers. And my name is Teresa Phillips, and I'm with Anderson School District 2 in Anderson County. Wanted to share a little bit about what we do in Anderson School District 2. One of the most important things that we have shared throughout our district is reaching our families where they are. We have been able to, along with Steve Feck and Lorelai Swanson, to put together some um, SEL packets of information, how to go um, and talk it through your student, read a book, do other activities and talk about and ask those questions that are social emotional based and helping them learn to problem solve, solve and make good decisions. Uh, and we have done that through going out into the community in apartment complexes, um, also at local places, whether it be the rec center or the library and be able to hand that information out to parents and to students. Um, children are very excited about receiving those packets and parents uh, can have this opportunity to have some family time with their students and know that they're helping uh, create that social emotional piece and, and those relational skills. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention as well is the significance of partnering with people that are already in your community, reaching out to your faith-based uh, communities um, and asking them to uh, support you and work together with you and other agencies and organizations. Um, even during the midst of a pandemic, we had what's called a back to school giveaway. 
and our local churches were able to collect the school supplies for all of our students that we uh, provided those for. Uh, during the pandemic, we also did uh, a drive through with that, with that, where we packed the backpacks and were able to put some information in those backpacks as well uh, and handed those out to the point where in the past and, and in the future, uh, we are able to have them come into um, a local organization and a local central place in our community and have them uh, collect those school supplies. But we have also had community organizations to do a resource fair for parents and families so that they can gather and know what's available to them in their, uh, in their communities. And that has been very helpful for just getting information out and helping them become more aware. So I'll talk a little bit about um, how we engage our parents um, from an attendance standpoint. Um, this is my second year in the district and last year, uh, I was certainly supported by the principals. I asked them honestly to uh, nominate somebody in their school who can be the lead for an attendance support team. Just as we monitor student achievement data, just as we monitor um, discipline data, we have to do the same thing and have a concentrated approach to monitoring attendance. And so we have attendance support teams at every school, which consists of either the assistant principal or the school counselor, um, a teacher, uh, another faculty member, and we're working on getting uh, a parent on the team as well. They're tracking the attendance, students who need interventions, we're providing those interventions early on, opposed to later. And then uh, we, we're just asking a simple question, how can we help? And their roles work right into our wellness visits. So at the school level and at the district level, we do something called well vis wellness visits. And we, we change the name to wellness visits opposed to home visits because when we are knocking on the door, uh, we are really asking the parents, what can we do to support? Like what barriers can we remove? When you hear home visit, you think a little bit on the, the punitive approach. Like your child has missed 10, 12 days if you don't get them to school, then we're going to report it to the courts. We're trying to step away and back away from that and come more with the restorative approach as where have you been? We miss you. And what barriers can we remove? And I'm glad to say that the schools, uh, as well as the district office, because uh, we get into the field and do wellness visits as well. We have completed last year uh, over 500 wellness visits to check on our students. And when you're doing those wellness visits, it's some of the most humbling things. You see some of the circumstances that our children have to face and our parents. And then we're able to offer as many resources as we can. But those wellness visits are so powerful because you see the circumstances that our kids are going in. And it helps you, uh, you know, it helps you check your biases if you think about it. Like, my goodness, this student hasn't been in school forever, like their parent. Right? Why are they not sending them to school? Well, this is a reason why they're probably not being sent to school. No running water, a, a hole in the floor, uh, a front door with, with, with bullet shots. These are things that we're seeing. And so we have to have that sense of urgency, but we also have to be compassionate and empathetic as well. I think that's a great idea. I think that's one of the important things of getting our educators out into the communities and helping them to see the home environments in which some of our students may be living. I think that's a great opportunity for that. And then also to remove that barrier of being in the school. I know we mentioned that. What is that parent's experience, past experience of being in the school? And so I think that's a huge piece in that. Um, one of the things that we focused on in Anderson School District 2 last year specifically is continuing on with our family events, but making those virtually. Uh, one of our schools is very in tune with making sure our parents have um, opportunities to learn about parenting skills. We partner with a uh, local pediatrician who is very well known in our area, and he does a wonderful presentation and, and discussion about growth and development and screen time and internet safety and, and how that works with um, children's minds and bodies and how they're growing. And our parents ask for that on a regular basis. So we were able to work it out where we did that virtually this past year. And then we were able to record that and also put it on that school's website and make it accessible to parents who weren't even able to attend 
the virtual event. Uh, thinking outside the box of ways to reaching our families uh, in the middle of a pandemic, but also just reaching them that's more convenient for them. Um, it's not about them showing up and being present when we want them to be, but making sure they receive the information and learn from the information and apply it in their homes and in their situations. Uh, one of the other events is making, uh, bringing awareness for mental health to our staff, to our students, to families, and to communities. Um, and I have my shirt on today because our football game tonight is an exciting time for us. We are doing Go Lime Green. Um, our football players will have on lime green socks. Our cheerleaders will have lime green uh, bows in. And we are bringing awareness about suicide prevention at a community level. What we want to do is make sure that we um, are working to remove the stigma of talking about suicide. And uh, it is a significant concern in our communities, uh, in our state and in our national level with our students, uh, with our families in general. And we just want to help remove that stigma so it can be a conversation. Our student council is involved with our high school with that. So that has helped very much and getting our students engaged. So our students will have lime green on. We have watched uh, presentations throughout the week about suicide prevention. We are partnering with NAMI, which is National Alliance on Mental Illness for this effort. And also with the Hayden Hurst Foundation. Uh, Hayden Hurst Foundation is with Hayden Hurst, who is a Atlanta Falcon uh, tight end. And he speaks and has a foundation that speaks out about mental wellness. And there will be a, um, public service announcement during our halftime of the game tonight, and it will be from Hayden Hurst speaking. So just partnering with people, helping uh, people to know it's not about a certain type of person or a certain socioeconomic status or any of that, but it crosses all barriers. And we wanna make sure that we bring that awareness that it's okay to talk about it. Uh, that is something that we're working with our staff as well. We've all talked about educators and the stress that they're under, and we want to help them be aware and be in tune of supporting their mental wellness as well. I want to, Teresa said something, I want to double click on something that she said, something about meeting parents where they are opposed to having a meeting and wanting them to be present when we want them to be. And I think that's important because typically the narrative is this, a school and I've been in this position before and I've been frustrated. And so I'm, I'm speaking from a personal experience. A school has a parent uh, engagement at the end of the day at, at five or six, they get maybe five, 10, 15, maybe 20 folks to attend. At the end, they're frustrated. They're like our parents aren't engaged. They're not involved because they didn't attend an event that we had at 6 p.m. And I think we get it's dangerous when we have such a, a, uh, a narrow metric to, to gauge parental engagement and involvement because a parent can be engaged but may not necessarily be as involved or, or vice versa. Let me explain. The, maybe the parent did show up to the event at 6 p.m., but maybe that same parent is checking parent port on a daily basis. Or maybe that same parent is emailing the teacher twice per week, or um, maybe that same parent is tutoring that child. They're just as engaged as the parent who's coming to the school at 6 p.m. to go to all of those events. So we need to be clear about that. And that's one of the things that we're grappling with here in Chester County School District. We're trying to figure out how can we engage our parents more and really engage them through our SIC. And the good thing about the SIC is that it provides that data for you. So you can see the, the specific uh, responses and you can drill down on that to see what can a school do internally to help change the narrative. But we got to step away from parents not coming to an event that we have at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday or a Friday and then we're all of a sudden saying, well, well, dang, they're not, they're not super engaged. That's dangerous. I agree with that. Let me make one more statement in reference to that. Um, also, Removing it from the school building, I think is a significant role a piece to this. Uh, what we have done is reached out to community functionings that are already happening. If you have a town event that has trick-or-treating 
uh, why are we not setting up a table and uh, providing some resources then. Uh, that is something that we did um, with um, an event that happens every year in our local community. And trick-or-treating is a very important piece of that. And so uh, Lorelai was a part of that and we were able to set up a table and be able to provide those SEL um, opportunities and providing that information to parents who come through there because they're trick-or-treating tr trick or treating with their students, with their children. And so I think that's a key piece. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at is partnering with other um, organizations, faith-based communities. We talked about that through our SIC programs. We are reaching out to local faith-based communities and saying, hey, can you put this information on your screen in the morning about the school and some things that are happening? Getting that information out to parents in different ways, um, making sure that we're connecting with them at a lot of different levels. You know, as, as Teresa speaks, I'm taking notes. I don't know if you if you can see it. Um, faith based is certainly important. So our Chester Ministerial Association, um, they're wonderful in our community. And uh, each school in our district, outside of one, and we're working on that currently, uh, is adopted by a church. And what that looks like is whatever the church has the capacity to do, whether it be tutoring, whether it be a food drive on the weekend, uh, whether it be uh, helping with teacher morale, that church is locking arms with the school and helping out. And it's so uh, important to have that relationship because um, it's, it's needed. Just FYI, we're at 11.41. So um, Will and Teresa, if y'all have anything else you'd like to share, feel free. Um, but we'd also love to open up the floor for questions. Um, or if you have like something that you just have to share or like applaud an idea you've heard, we'd love to invite you as the audience to weigh in, um, either coming off mute or putting your ideas or questions in the chat. I know so far in the chat, there's a lot of people resonating with everything that's being said, getting, getting out into the community, meeting people where they are. Um, Tons of people resonating with everything that's been shared. So thank y'all so much for that feedback. One of the things while we're going through with the um, chat and seeing if there are any questions, I just wanted to mention the importance of uh, merging SEL and academics with the MTSS framework. Uh, that's something in our district that we're working on and making sure that we incorporate that. It's not two separate things, but the academic role and the uh, behavioral needs of students and social emotional supports of students um, merging together. And so when we look at those questions of what are we doing for our students, um, what are they learning? What, what do we need to help them learn? And that question number three of what do we need to help them learn with? Uh, we're wanting to make sure that we're meeting those social emotional needs and uh, those behavioral needs so that they can be successful um, at the academic level. I don't know if you all can hear me. My name is Devin Waldrop. Um, I want to actually work with Teresa, so I'm a little bit um, closer to some of these efforts than um, maybe some of the other participants here. But I want to go back and touch on one of the things she shared. I think it was a really nice innovation. She talked about doing some virtual family events um, and, you know, partnering with a local pediatrician. And then um, obviously within this kind of current environment of being virtual and, and COVID, putting that information online. And so one thing that I think is a really nice innovation, I was speaking with the mental health director in a different school district recently. She was disclosing that one of the ways that they've been able to kind of engage their community more is they've worked, you know, in-house with their IT people and have started doing these live streaming kinds of um, topics, whatever, whatever the community wants to hear about. So it could be from a pediatrician, could be from some, a yoga oriented person talking about mindfulness or some yoga strategies, but they've been live streaming these things on YouTube and Facebook. And those have been really successful platforms. And that specific district is fairly large, but she was mentioning something in the ballpark of four to 5,000, you know, people logged on paying attention to these things. So I think, you know, I, I don't want to let that go kind of unpassed or understated, but I think that moving to online 
through. So that's a great kind of um, innovation there. And I think that might be something that um, could be applicable to a lot of the people here in this um, conference today. That is a great example. And um, I, I think I might be I might be familiar with the district you're referencing, or maybe there's more than one that's doing it. But I know one of the evenings they held an event, it was like end of school year, a Tuesday night, probably everyone is just, you know, all but ready for summer vacation. And they had 150 parents show up live for that presentation. And by the next day, it was like hundreds more views. Um, so when you think about, like Dr. Pickens said earlier, bringing folks into a building, if they can't get there for that very short window of time, they miss out on all that information. But if we're getting it out to them and housing it in a place they can access it later, all the better um, for many more to access it then and later. Good afternoon. Good morning, excuse me. I'm uh, chiming in from District 19. Uh, Dr. Pekin, Pekins, thank you for your information because I definitely can relate to the fact that you're talking about having a meeting where, you know, we, the parent that doesn't show up and we always get discouraged because of the look of the crowd uh, there. And that's the benefit of having and updating and keeping a uh, parent porting. I used to work with power school. Now I'm the title one uh, family engagement liaison and the career specialist here in my district. However, you said some key things to me that made sense because we always judge parents that don't always show up to things. And that's not necessarily saying they're not engaged with their children. Um, what our, our former superintendent told us, he never, his parents never attended anything that was happening at the school, but they always took care of what they needed to take care of at home with him as far as a student. And I, I think that is so important because we got to get away from that, you know, and judging parents, not knowing their situation, but I, you know, we, that's a to me that is a great comment you made earlier we have to we got to change that you know th right now with COVID this thing my classes started last week and the first thing I asked my students are you okay because we these children are dealing with something that they've never thought that they would encounter in their lives you know and the, it's enough the staff have to deal with it and the mental health maintaining for us is enough but to look in the faces of our children and not you know to see the discouraging that they they don't see their their friends sitting next to them because some either are quarantined or some are have lost someone because of COVID you know it's no time for judging anymore we got to definitely put aside judgmental attitudes because these kids are suffering on levels that we will never understand I've always said that I, I just where and how a person where they're coming from where they live it's just none of our business our job is to help better the situation. Because as change agents that's our job is to help change the situation and not judge the situation. You know, from when people come I thank you all for for what i've heard I had trouble logging in with the link that was given. Um, but I somehow or another, I did manage to get uh, connected when Kayla sent me the information. I didn't catch the entire presentation, but what I've caught so far is definitely is definitely needed. Social emotional learning is definitely something we need to be focusing on other than trying to get a rating for a report card right now, because we've got to get our kids back in tune to the routine of becoming educated. COVID has knocked these children so far off to this kind of crazy. And, and again, as the liaison here, the family engagement, I, it's my determination is to actually try everything that, and I, I'm well known here in the community and that's the plus side, because I live here and that's, that's a big plus. And I tell my coworkers all the time, and I don't want to take up all the time. I tell my coworkers all the time, they're at, they're at home, but my phone is constantly ringing or my inbox is steadily chiming. If I go to the grocery store, if I go to Walmart, you know, I'm hearing all the concerns and I try to bring it back to my principal, assistant principal and school counselor. You know, we we have a big task before us and it's not going to change overnight, but it's better suited if we take away the judgmental attitude we have and implement compassion, and love, patience and endurance because it's going to take some time to rebuild what we had prior to COVID. Thank you for the time. Give me a time to speak.
Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Tom is almost up. Does anyone have any other questions? We really appreciate you coming today and y'all get a little lunch and then we'll see you back at one. Thank you everyone for joining us and for your thoughtful comments. Thank y'all so much. We loved being with you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for moderating. Well, y'all did a great job. I enjoyed it. And I, hopefully we can all work together. I love that. Thank you. Bye.